Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chip Rout. Uh, Dr. Rout uh, spent a good part of his career at uh, Harborview Hospital in Seattle and has been for the last uh, several years in uh, UT Houston um, at uh, Memorial Hermann Hospital. Um, Chip has got uh, an incredibly large experience uh, and insight into the treatment of pelvic ring injuries and acetabular fractures, uh, probably one of the largest experiences in the world. He trained many of the uh, faculty that you'll hear speak over the next little bit and re really needs no introduction in this topic. So the next talk will be Dr. Chip Rout, who will speak to us on the uh, indications and techniques for uh, percutaneous fixation around the pelvis. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to just uh, welcome everyone and give you good greetings from Texas. It's very hot down here and it's hot from temperature wise and we're, we're COVID hot as well. And these are the patient, uh, the people that are keeping me safe uh, throughout all of this. And I'm really grateful for, for their help. This is our orthopedic trauma crew. My task today is to go through percutaneous fixation and uh, we'll stick mostly to the posterior pelvis as a result of the time, but I'm challenged by uh, presenting to you the indications as well as the contraindications. The osseous fixation pathways in a little bit more detail, they've already been introduced to you. And then I'd like to just go through some of the planning and some of the technical aspects of uh, just taking care of a patient this patient actually that you see before you um, in a fairly urgent manner when she wasn't doing so well. I think y'all understand that closed reduction in percutaneous fixation was born out of just some of the problems that were published in the 80s from the earlier attempts at open reduction. And those have been improved, of course, over the past uh, decade or two, but the, those things still threaten us. We also realized that uh, this would have been a patient when I was a resident uh, that would have been in the hospital for about four to six weeks in traction, and then maybe a week or two in a body cast or a little bit, I mean, a month or two in a body cast. And you can understand that maybe after about an hour and a half in the operating room as a result of the C-arm and some knowledge of osteology and a little bit of traction, we can uh, make some stab wounds, put some screws in, and on he goes about three days later home. A big, uh, a big uh, transformation of care came along with the knowledge of osteology and fluoroscopy and these techniques that we've learned over the past 30 years. Along with the evolution of learning comes issues and uh, perhaps you can see that this patient's had their symphysis uh, plated. They've had some spine issues and you can see the, the guide pin going in for the iliosacral screw on the outlet view and then you can see on the inlet view that the guide pin has been applied but it may be uh, the details of some of these things that we're going to go over in the next 30 minutes will alert you when we're through that this is not as safe as it looks and if you're really keen on what Dr. Mark Adams introduced to you as just uh, some of these osteological details that we see in the imaging how critical it is maybe you wouldn't be so surprised to know that the uh, surgeon had an avoidable complication as a result of just not understanding the osteology though has a fairly significant uh, complication to deal with. So minor little details and understanding of the osteology. Hopefully when you finish in the next 30 minutes, you'll be um, a little bit more knowledgeable and also motivated to learn some more. We do recognize the daunting nature of this and really it's just uh, what, when and how. So let's start with the indications and then we'll ease on into the contraindications. Uh, in reality, um, you have to have the posterior ring reduced, and so it can be essentially any injury to the posterior ring, a sacral fracture, a sacroiliac injury, a combination injury, but we have to get a reduction. And you can see in this situation, uh, the chances of getting this accurately reduced with a closed reduction are probably about zero, and so we do still use open reduction and then use the percutaneous fixation. Sometimes it's as simple as just taking off the circumferential wrap and applying some traction. And this was a patient of mine from 1994, right after we had gotten cannulated screws. And you could see that we were able to do a nice percutaneous job with two stab wounds on her to get her realigned and stabilized uh, quite nicely. So we can do uh, sometimes very simple things to help our patients get uh, reduced and then stabilized. One of the things we learned very early on was that the sacroiliac joint injuries were very different from the sacral fractures. And we realized that the pathology for an iliosacral screw was pretty small or not very lengthy uh, for our sacroiliac injury, but it's different uh, from a standpoint of um, using the screw, how it starts, where it aims, where it goes, does it avoid the joint, and which way should we insert it and start it and aim it. 
as opposed to the sacral fracture pathology, which is a little more medial and gives us a larger area of instability for the screw to gain purchase in. And you can see the dotted line represents the now popular transsacral screws that weren't really available until 2006. You may say, well, what was going on before 2006? There weren't screws that were made beyond 130 millimeters in length. And so it took a long time for screws to be long enough for us to be able to use transsacral fixation. <clears throat> Other indications are just any, indi any disruption of the posterior pelvic ring that can be reduced and put back. Sometimes we have to redo the ilium in order to just do the iliosacral screws. And then it's not just for adults and elders, it can be for children as well. It's a three-year-old that took care of about six months ago who was inadvertently run over. And you can see that she's three years old, but she's got an open pelvic injury that's uh, fairly uh, potentially catastrophic. And you can see uh, the, 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 the problem that she had. And so people say, well, you know, do you have to use smaller screws? Those are three, five screws in the ilium and seven O screws in her SI joints. So we can put them back together. A lot of people will say, well, children really don't need this because they just, um, they remodel so well. But you can tell that to some of these patients like this nine-year-old who was also run over when she was five years old. And this is how she's lived for the last four years. And with an early open reduction and stable fixation, this would have been a fairly simple fix. But at five years later, this is a really difficult situation to negotiate. It also happens in the resuscitation phase. You've seen this uh, already described to you, and this is an example of a patient with some fairly severe injuries, but despite the uh, overall resuscitation, not so good. And then this is just a patient that we put a hole in the sheet, uh, we can put some towels on, and then we can become a part of this resuscitation effort where uh, we can use in a directed iliosacral screw for certain injuries in the back. And as we insert the lag screw, you can see we get a nice a compressive reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. And if you'll take your attention away from the injured right SI joint and look at the left SI joint, you'll realize that it uh, has some problems as well. And if you were uh, paying attention, when we went back to the injury film, you can see now in retrospect, the both sacroiliac joint injuries have a fairly significant injury to them. And then you can see that in the circumferential wrap, the left side looks pretty good. But then as soon as we compress it, the left side reveals itself. So we can go ahead and just do the same thing on the other side, support the posterior ring and get a nice reduction. Interestingly, usually when you do this, these patients respond to this very well. And within about five to 10 minutes, they usually start to plane out very well. So this is a, a good technique and it's similar to using a C-clamp, but it's just a more definitive measure. Some of our patients are, um, we always hear this, this thing that the, the patient is too sick for orthopedics, TSFO, too sick for orthopedics, but sometimes they're so sick they need orthopedics, so they're SSTNO. And so we'd like to do early percutaneous fixation and reduction of some of these fairly difficult injuries uh, to help the patient have a stable pelvis and then just get an upright chest so that other injuries and polytrauma can be dealt with. And so sometimes we can do simple maneuvers to manipulate the pelvis, get a reduction, then use per percutaneous fixation. And then finally, just this stability issue. I think we all have been taught that if you just close the book, like you can see here in the upper right corner, the sacroiliac joint looks like it's an incomplete injury, should just be able to snap the symphysis back together, plate the symphysis, be okay. But you can see in the operative views, the symphysis has been plated, but the SI joint forgot that it was supposed to be an incomplete injury. In fact, it's a complete injury. So we have to be prepared to use the screws in this situation as well. We also have soft tissue implications where we might want to really do an open reduction, but it's probably not a smart thing to do. And then we have, an, uh, at least in North America, the, the rampant obesity where when we have to use techniques to get the abdomen away from our planned operative field. And sometimes it's only eight inches deep to the symphysis and it'd be 20 inches deep to the SI joint. And so we choose to do percutaneous of the posterior pelvic ring after doing the anterior ring open. We also have patients with chronic instability. Oftentimes it's uh, postpartum females. You can see this patient has a re residual distraction and chronic instability five years after having a child. And we can do the iliosacral screws to help stabilize the posterior pelvic ring. It happens in males as well. This is a man that was injured when he played college uh, baseball three, uh, 30 years earlier. And he has chronic pelvic instability as well with uh, sacroiliac arthritis. And so it's a good, uh, good situation for them. And then we have patients that have uh, unusual situations where they have these long spinal instrumentations. They tend to break down their posterior ring. Sometimes like this patient had infections anteriorly and posteriorly. And once we can control the infections a little bit, we can provide stability. 
We can also use it for pathological conditions and not just, just tumors, but also other pathological conditions. This, of course, is a primary tumor, and we can work with our colleagues in the oncology areas to sort of help provide stability for those. We see the residual of cancer treatment treatment in some of our prostate patients where they've had radiation that was a little bit less than directed. If it's a little bit older radiation, they get radiation necrosis and they can have U-shaped sacral fractures as a result of this. And then we can see just sometimes the privilege of maturity uh, as people age and continue to be active. Sometimes they'll have bone quality issues. This lady just fell down three steps and you can see she's got a unstable y, backward Y component. And we can just do percutaneous for that. So the percutaneous is really nice for a lot of different things. And then you can also remember that we'll have patients with acetabular injuries and we'll get real focused on the left acetabular injury, but then we have to look in the posterior pelvic ring on the other side and we can see a, a complete disruption as well. And usually if we get the acetabulum tidied up and the symphysis put back together, we get a nice closed reduction of the contralateral posterior pelvic ring and can we, we can use iliosacral screws to stabilize that percutaneously. I would say the contraindications are what we said earlier is when you can't really uh, get the reduction right or your manipulation fails. And so we see a lot of malreduction as a result of people being uh, pretty bullheaded about just doing closed reductions. And so if the closed reduction is not working or if the injury is not amenable and needs an open reduction, then you have to do an open reduction. You also see people with debris in their tunnels that needs to come out. And then also there, there are other indications where you just need an open reduction with a closed technique doesn't work. We also want you to realize that uh, just because this body of knowledge is not so new and the evolution has been going on for 30 years, a lot of people are still struggling with this. And so hopefully by the end of this situation, you won't be one of the strugglers that has these wayward screws that cost them a lot of money. Sometimes it hurts the patients and it costs the doctors money. You can see here just some of the randomness to iliosacral screws all done by people that are pretty experienced. So, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not able to access the Q&A right now, and so hopefully that there are questions about evolution of learning or indications or contraindications, you can send those through into the QA area, and then if uh, there's something that I need to get to or discuss it, we can uh, do it in the, uh, in the decompression area later. I'm gonna switch gears and go from indications and contraindications to the OFPs, and Mark has already alluded to that, and we're gonna talk about the osseous fixation pathways, and you know that on the pelvis, there are osseous fixation pathways everywhere. The problem is most of them are curved, and we usually have straight screws so far, and so what we wanna to try to do is um, to use a, a, a term, uh, we would like to straighten out these curved areas. And this is sort of what we come up with when we look at the pelvic model and superimpose these osseous fixation pathways. And the colored ones are the ones that we use, the red, the yellow, the black, the blue, the white, the green. These are the ones that we use most commonly. And so today we're just gonna focus on the posterior pelvic ring or the iliosacral one. And when I first started doing this, there was a lot of uh, attention to the starting point and where it was in relationship to the posterior ridge on the lateral ilium, the crista glutei. And so we realized that uh, pretty quickly that on just a single axial image, you can see you can have a variety of starting points and they can all be very safe screws depending on where you aim them and where you stop them. But we can see that the starting point is important, but just like aim and direction and length, um, they're all important. Everything is important. Simplistically, if you just want to get a better handle on the osteology of the upper sacral segment, it's pretty simple just to think about ellipsoids, tunnels, and, and cylinders. And if you'll take some cylinders, and if you have a kid, maybe you've got some building blocks at your house if your child plays with building blocks, and you can stack some cylinders, and then you can add some ellipsoid cubes onto them as well, onto the sides, and Imagine where the foramen or these tunnels would be that go back toward the spinal canal that allow the nerve roots to drape over the ellipsoids and through the tunnels. And you can see that the nerve roots are going to go from central, cranial, and posterior in the spinal canal over the ala and through the tunnels to a peripheral caudal anterior area. And so sometimes it's just simplistically stacking cylinders, adding on some ellipsoids, putting in a tunnel, and then you can understand this a little bit more. If you turn it on its side, you can see the, the cylinders sort of look like the upper sacrum. The ellipsoids have the look of the uh, sacral ala, and then the orange tube uh, shows the pathway of the S1 nerve root, where those nerve roots, again, going from central cranial and posterior to peripheral caudal 
and anterior. Usually if you look at uh, um, little kids or young kids or adolescents, they've got the best osteology for uh, lateral sacral imaging. And so if you want to see it better, sometimes the kids have the, the best look. And you can see this child has a really nice um, uh, set of osteology. And we can add on our cylinder to one and we can stack one onto two and understand how those go. And then we can superimpose the ellipsoids with the ala R. And then we can add in and pull away and just look at this to try to understand where these tunnels go relative to where the ellipsoids are and the tunnel for one and the tunnel for two and the nerve root of L5, the nerve root through the one tunnel and the nerve root through the two tunnel. And so we start to see things a little bit differently when we start to superimpose the, geom the geometrical figures onto them. You can also sort of circle up the tunnel exit points or the foramen, we call them foramen, but these are just nothing more than tunnel exit points and actually represent a shoot rather than a, a circle. When you look at the 3D modeling, this is the, um, you know, I really would have given a lot of money or I would have given probably a finger uh, in donation to have had 3D surface rendered images when I was first learning this. I think um, y'all's generation is so lucky for so many reasons and I'm, I'm really uh, jealous uh, to the point of almost resentful uh, that I don't, I didn't have these three dimensional surface rendered images, but all that uh, sin confessing, I'm gonna just say I'm very happy to still be able to partake in this. And I hope you can see that when you start looking at this modeling, you'll start to see a lot of the things that you really need to see. And I hope you'll look at them differently after we finish today. I'd also start to alert you to thinking about what you're not seeing on the surface rendered images. And remember, we're talking about these tunnels and these pathways that go through the bone. And then what we're trying to do is correlate it to what we see in the operating room. And so one of the things that might help you is to go back and forth between plain film imaging and the, uh, like this is uh, an outlet image. And you can see that we can start to see what we can see with the modeling, see what we can see by knowing what the anatomy is and then looking at the imaging that we would see in the operating room and maybe identifying that there are tunnels and pathways and exit points to these tunnels for the upper and second sacral segments. And maybe when we pull that away, when we look at this, you can see it. And when we pull it away, maybe you can see this little lucent spike of cast a little bit better than you saw it 30 minutes ago. Mark got into the dysmorphism and on the upper row here in the black background, you can see what we would call a normal osteology. On the bottom row, we see this, this upper sacral segment, particularly on the far right, if you look at the outlet image, you'll be able to really get an alert as to the dysmorphism off of the outlet images. And if we go in that a little bit deeper, you can see the two side by side and you can get a clue to these radiographic hallmarks that you'd notice on an outlet view for dysmorphism. Now, I'll just say dysmorphism doesn't mean a thing to anybody unless they're trying to stabilize a posterior pelvic ring injury and get a screw into that conduit of bone safely. So maybe a, a, a skeletal radiologist in some remote uh, dark uh, reading room is interested in dysmorphism, but in reality, nobody really cares about dysmorphism except us when we're trying to put screws in them safely. And the patients, of course, care that you know about it also. But we can look at that outlet view on the right side and we can sort of see that one of the early clues that you can quickly identify is when the L5S1 or the upper sacral lumbar transition disc is at the level of the iliac crest like you see in the dysmorph. On the normal or what we call normal, you can see it's recessed relative to the iliac crest. We can also notice that there's a residual disc on the dysmorph, usually reflecting a segmentation error or delay in segmentation. And then we can see also the residual transverse process of that vertebra, as we call them mammillary bodies or mammillary processes, or some people call them just residual transverse process. You can also see the acuity of the alar slope, and it, it goes from central cranial to peripheral uh, lateral caudal. And you can also see it goes from cranial posterior to caudal anterior. And the acuity of the slope or the angular nature of the slope is, is much greater with the dysmorph. Again, that's gonna impact our screws so much. And then of course the exit points are misshapen. They're not quite circular all the time for the dysmorphs as they are for what we call the normals. And it, if you look at the normals, you can see that there's lots of different pathways as Mark showed you. He's already shown you these pathways at the upper and the second sacral segment in a normal. And then if you look at the dysmorph, it changes a whole lot. You can see, especially in the upper sacral segment, you can do obliques and transsacral for the normal, but at the dysmorph, you've got to really do oblique. And again, that's a caudal posterior 
start to a cranial anterior endpoint. If we go back to the normal, you can see we can make the oblique screws in the upper sacral segment yellow or the pathways yellow. We can make the transsacral blue and we can make the orange at the second sacral segment where it is. And you notice that orange and blue are anterior on the inlet view. If you look in the upper right view, they're anterior. And that, that anterior location, especially caudally on the upper sacral segment is where the bone is. That's why we put it there, is where the bone is. On the lateral view, you can see that we can kind of confirm the safety of all of these implants as we put them in. And you can see that the obliquity of the yellow or the upper sacral segment oblique pathway, that's gonna be a little bit tough because a lot of you like the iliac cortical density to represent where the ala is. And in people who are non-dysmorphic, usually the iliac cortical density will give you a good reflection of where the alar slope is, but it really depends on where you're looking at the point or the end of that screw. If you look at this one, where those screws are ending on the inlet view, you see up the top right, you see the yellow screws are ending in the vertebral body and just barely beyond the midline. But you can understand that those keep it very safe. And so that lateral look of a screw above the ICD in the lower right, you see the screw tip or that pathway is above the ICD. But again, they're staying contained within the vertebral body. If you get a little aggressive and you forget about these, these limits, remember there's an ala on the other side. And so that oblique look or that lateral look of the oblique screw, it's gonna look the same for a screw that's safe like you see here, focus on the lower right corner, and you'll see that when we extrude through the contralateral ala, the lateral is going to look the same. If you look above now, you'll see the inlet and the outlet views would look pretty safe to us. Even though the screw is superimposed in the operating room, the screw is going to be superimposed on the bone. If we forget that high anterior of the alar area has no bone, we would not understand that our screw had extruded beyond the cortical limit on the left side. Again, the caudal anterior location within the osseous fixation pathway, the upper sacral segment of a normal, it's a caudal anterior location. And you can look at this ellipsoid and understand that there is room in a lot of patients that's just a slight bit cranial and posterior to it. But again, the takeoff where the spinal canal enters into the nerve root tunnel, that sometimes will impact that area. So that's a little bit more of a risky screw. I always tell people it's like putting a big fat guy in an elevator. That blue screw, that transsacral screw in the lower anterior corner, if you're filling up an elevator, especially these days with social distancing, you want the biggest guy in the furthest corner so that then you have room to put in others in the elevator. It's the same thing for the transsacral screw in the upper and the sacral sex in the second sacral segment. We want to put the first screw low and anterior so we have room cranial and posterior. If we go right down the middle and try to optimize our safety, then uh, we don't, we're not going to have room for that second screw if we need it. We can also go to the second sacral segment. Again, the low anterior quadrant or the low anterior area in the osseous fixation pathway is an ideal spot for it. And again, some patients like this patient would have room for a second screw at S2 as well. Again, slightly cranial and a little posterior to the first one. As you can see, it's marked there on the inlet and the outlet is the, uh, the beige or the white uh, conduit. One of the things that people get in trouble with is they see that white bar or that white tube superimposed on the tunnel of S1 on the outlet image. So if you look at the top left image there, that's an outlet view. And you could see that if that white tube wasn't posteriorly located within the ellipsoid of the ala, it would be in the nerve root. So if it was anterior, if that white tube was anteriorly located, and you can look over to the inlet on the right and see that it's posterior. If it was anterior, it would not be safe. It would be in the tunnel exit area of one. And so I'll draw your attention to these tunnels now. I'd really like you to sort of focus on what you're seeing with the radiology. We see these foramen or we see these circular areas. And I want to just counsel you that when we're looking at these circular areas, we want to be a little bit more specific and detailed about it because we want to think about the playground shoot that our kids come sliding out and we probably all enjoy doing this and come shooting at it. But you can see the, the, the tube has an exit point, but then there's a chute that allows the child not to just fall onto the, the, the 
the sawdust there. And the, the bone is just like that in the front of the sacral tunnel. And don't you see the exit point is not just a circle, it's a chute. And so it's just like the playground chutes that we, we can see. And so we want to think about that when we're doing our outlet imaging. And we want to recognize the, the spherical openings, but we want to also realize that there are chutes there. So if we put that screw high and anterior, it's not going to be safe at all. It's going to be in that chute and can damage that S1 nerve root needs to be posterior like we show here, like we talked about. So I mean, this is all just the normal pathways and we, we've gone through this, I think enough. So um, if you have questions, please put them in and we'll get through those related to the osseous fixation pathways of the upper sacral and second sacral segment for the, the uh, non-dysmorph. I wanna just amplify the dysmorph a little bit more because it's so important and you saw that wayward screw earlier and we wanna recognize on the outlet view on the lower left, all of these radiographic markers of dysmorphism that we saw. But in the operating room, one of the critical impacts is the yellow and the white arrows. And I'll call your attention to the right side of the screen because the white arrows represent the alar anterior cortical limit of the upper sacral segment, the dysmorphic upper sacral segment. And in the operating room, we have to tilt the fluoroscopy on the inlet view appropriately to where we can see the anterior cortical limit of the upper sacral segment, the white arrows, and we can distinguish then the anterior cortical limit of the second sacral segment because we may want to put a screw there as well. And we want to see the yellow arrows representing the anterior cortical limit of the second sacral segment as well. This is imaging that we can plan preoperatively based on the three-dimensional surface and volume rendered images that we have in front of us, just like I'm doing right here. So I can plan what views are going to give me the discrete osteology limits that I need in order to keep me safe. I know I've got to keep my screw behind the anterior cortical limit of S1 and S2, the upper and the second sacral segments, and I realize I've got to direct the screws obliquely in order to accommodate that at the upper sacral segment. So pay attention to the inlets when you're looking at the surface rendered images because they're going to help you get the appropriate inlet tilt for S1 and S2 as you're doing these screws. And they're gonna to reveal to you these alar anterior cortical limits so that you can keep your screws just behind these at these two different levels. So when we look at the upper sacral segment, we've gotta do oblique screws, caudal, posterior to cranial, anterior directed. And we pretty much have to stop in the midline in order to be safe in the upper sacral segment of a dysmorph. In the second sacral segment, you can see we can do transsacral screws. But again, we've got to locate it away from the chute of the upper sacral segment. We can also do oblique screws at the second sacral segment if we want to. I'm not sure many people do that, but from a technical aspect, uh, you know, it is osteologically possible. It's just not uh, probably... Um, something that people do too much. I'm not sure I've ever done that screw in my whole life, but I do know that it's possible if I ever would wanna do something like that. It's always nice to know stuff, I guess. Yeah. So again, I just wanna recap this dysmorphism and I just I wanna really alert you to going a little bit cranial and anterior and alert you to that shoot. Can't, uh, can't emphasize it enough. So We've uh, now hit the osseous fixation pathways. Hopefully you know about the normal and dysmorph, the outlet or the, where we really get the identifiers radiographically to alert us to this. And then those indentations recognizing the anterior alar limits, that's so important on the inlet, it's adjusted and customized to fit. And for the upper sacral segment screws, remember we're going caudal to cranial and posterior to anterior in order to accommodate that and don't forget the chutes. Reductions, I could spend, uh, we could go on uh, reductions for four hours, but we're not, we're just gonna say that for the posterior pelvic ring and for iliosacral screws and lining up these tubes, it's like a Venn diagram or like, it's like putting tubes together as well because we've got to put the reduction back. We've got to put the bone fracture fragments back together or the sacroiliac joint back together in alignment so that we can make safer screws and we have a improved area for access of our screws and also for a better outcome of our patient. And we can do whatever it takes. If you're doing closed reduction, you can use traction, wrap up the knees like Hans just showed you, external fixers, universal distractors, clamping through open wounds, circles, uh, you know, working portals in a sheet, sometimes oblique frames, a lot of different things work. So to wrap up, we're just going to go through a planning and just uh, sort of take the patient we showed you earlier with the fairly dramatically displaced left hemi pelvis, and we're going to use all of our radiographic clues to help us go through this planning. 
And so you can see our patient is, uh, she's a 38 year old female. She's a recovering, a recovering narcotic addict. She's in the backseat of a car. She's in a rollover motor vehicle accident. She wasn't tossed out, but probably wasn't belted. And she's got some injuries. And you can see a left sacroiliac injury that's fairly complicated and displaced, bilateral pubic ramus fractures, and uh, I would say a fairly significant deformity. And if we look at her volume rendered views, we can get an idea of the amount of displacement that she shows when she's in her circumferential wrap. So the wrap, her pelvic wrap is really accentuated her deformity. And we can see this pretty dramatically on the inlet view. And you can take things away if that helps you. You can superimpose the surface rendered images on the volume rendered images and adjust the tilt so you can see and maybe some of you have noticed that she has a left-sided asymmetrical dysmorphism she had a segmentation error that was mostly on the left side and then we can also take these three dimensional these surface rendered images and we can correlate in the operating room what we're going to see and we can magnify these and even superimpose these in our preoperative planning so that we can understand when we're looking in the operating room, I'd like you to be able to see uh, this surface rendered image in your brain when you're looking at these fluoroscopy views and then things become a little bit clearer. Same thing with the volume rendered outlet. You can see here a hemidysmorphism of the upper segment. I don't even know if that's a, I don't know what you call it. It doesn't matter to me. That's just a place we're probably not gonna put a screw is what I would call it, but you can see it now and you can see uh, some of the radiographic markers on the outlet. But this, that next segment, what we would call the normal sacral segment, we can see pretty well. And realize when you're looking at the outlet view in the operating room, that yellow bar represents the cranial limit of the ala, but that's way posterior. It doesn't really give you any indication about the alar slope, especially from posterior to anterior, much less from central to uh, peripheral. So realize what you're looking at are these radiographic lines or these densities that occur, and we're trying to make this thing three-dimensional in our brain. You can also use these surface rendered images like you see on the right to uh, sort of ghost into what you're planning for the operating room as well. And we'd like you again to start seeing these when you're looking at this in the operating room. It'll help you so much if you can see that when you're in the operating room looking at that. So in planning, the axial images become really critical as well because the axial images are gonna give you a lot of information like Dr. Adams has gone over with you. You can see the injury sites in the front and the back. You can see whether there's gonna be an opportunity for a transsacral screw. You can see and measure with the PAX machine uh, the length. I, you know, when we had plane films, there was no way to do this type of planning, but we can, know if we have screws that are long enough to accommodate the length, should we be able to get that left-sided posterior pelvic ring reduced? We can also see how the width or the breadth of this conduit, at least on this single axial image, so we know that if we can put a seven millimeter screw in that or how many seven millimeter screws we can fit into that interval. We also can plan on the normal side, if there's a contralateral normal side, we can plan maybe the oblique pathway if we want to, because the normal side was, is reduced, assuming it's symmetrical. And you can use your eyeballs there to see that that left side, the injured side, that conduit of bone for the iliosacral screw would be a little wider. You'd have an even greater safety on the injured side than you're going to have here. And you can, again, measure, say, well, it's going to be about an 80 millimeter screw, and I've got 16 millimeters if I go oblique, as opposed to the 11 millimeters that I had if I went transsacral. So when we go transsacral, we complicate things by narrowing, narrowing those ellipsoids of availability or that osseous fixation pathway. And then when we go oblique, we improve the safety because it gives us a wider area to go. So a lot of people like oblique screws because they're a safer screw. It's a wider conduit of bone to hit. A lot of people think about the, um, these osseous fixation pathways as uh, hourglasses, where the lateral ilium is the base of the hourglass and the waist of the hourglass is where the tunnel and the L5 nerve root are. And then the other part of the hourglass is uh, the other base is where the, the vertebral body is. And so you can think about it however you want that gives you the ability to sort of uh, see it in your brain. We also can plan for the second sacral segment, but in this patient, you can see if we don't get a reduction, we got no action going on here. We're gonna have a screw that doesn't even get in the unstable part, so we've gotta get a reduction. And we can see that it's also much narrower in its breadth than it, the, the upper sacral segment. And then we also have to realize that we're much more 
caudally located and closer to the greater notch. And so we have to start paying attention to where the gluteal trunk is. When we're in the upper sacral segment, usually we're up in the branches of the gluteal tree, the, the, the trunk is arborized. And then when we're down here by the greater notch, we're putting the gluteal um, trunk at risk. So I would also tell you that you and your x-ray tech can plan even things as the obliquity, the lateral cortical surface of where the screw is gonna land and where the screw is gonna exit if you do a transsacral screw. And that amount of obliquity may vary depending upon which sides you're on and how much reduction you get. But you can plan for this and you can sight it and see what that lateral cortical surface looks like so you can get a good image. I like the x-ray techs to also just look at the sagittal imaging so they know what kind of tilt they're gonna need in order to stack the cranial two or the upper and second sacral segments. Not always are they like a bamboo pole. Sometimes they've got arthritis at the L5S1 disc that changes things. But you can see we just got a supine patient here up on a bump in traction on the left. And then we're just sort of getting our X-ray the way we want to superimpose so we can reliably go there. The tech can mark the machine, mark the floor, and then just go right back and forth between the inlet and the outlet. Again, superimposing the upper symphysis on the S1 area, so or the S2 area, so we can see the S1 tunnel exit point. And if you look, this is a non-orthogonal system, and so you can realize that when you make a an anterior move, like the uh, arrow shows here on the inlet view, you're going to make an inadvertent caudal move on the outlet view. It's always best if these are completely biplanar or orthogonal, but they're not always that way, so we have to adjust. Dr. Graves wrote a paper about that. And again, you can do the screws prone or supine. It doesn't matter to me. You can just plan your inlet and your outlet tilt based on whatever position it is that you like to put the patient in. And then finally, you can take the sagittal image and you can put the cursor in the conduit of bone. Let's just say that we put it right here in this caudal anterior upper sacral segment area. And then we can just scroll from side to side as we go and see if that transsacral screw is even possible in that conduit. Same thing for the cranial posterior one. And then the second sacral segment, you can see that ellipsoid gets a little tight right there. And this is looking just off of the, uh, the midline area. This is looking out where the tunnels are occurring. You can see the one and two tunnels occurring in that area. Anyway, lots of planning can happen off of the sagittal by just scrolling on the, on the machine. So we come up with a plan where we're gonna to have to get a reduction of some sort and we'd like I like to use a, uh, a, a low anterior yellow uh, transsacral screw at upper sacral segment. We'd like to use a, the white one, a, a second one that's a little bit more cranial and posterior within the safe osseous fixation pathway, the upper sacral segment. We, we probably are going to need an open reduction of the back and the front somehow. Uh, that would be our ideal is to really make this thing as uh, perfect as possible. And uh, that would be our, our goal. And we can see that's our incision we plan for the front and then we'll decide how we're gonna to get to the back. And we may wanna to go to the second sacral segment if we can get a reduction. The only problem is that the patient doesn't read our plan and our osteological or fluoroscopic plans may not coincide with what's going on. And this patient has an extraperitoneal and intraperitoneal bladder injury. And so she's gonna get a long uh, midline laparotomy sort of in an urgent way. And then we're gonna meet her this way. They're gonna say, it's Saturday at 7 a.m. Can you please come to 28? And as I walk in, the Trauma surgeon says she's kind of sick. Uh, if you're going to do something, you know, it'd be really good for her pelvis, but don't do too much. Well, this kind of hurts me because now I'm limited and I realize she's got an art line in her groin. She's got a, a long venous line in her groin as well. She's uh, lost some blood as a result of the laparotomy and I've been presented with a fairly, uh, I would say not a critically ill patient, but a not well patient. So we're gonna stay with the supine. We're gonna put her in some traction, put her up on the bump. This is just some folded blankets that we put under the sacrum to elevate them off and keep them balanced to where they're not teeter-tottering. It's gotta be wide enough to where it keeps them from teetering. It's gotta be long enough to where it sort of supports their sacrum and their, their entire sacrum and their lumbar spine. Works out just fine. Then we can square them up with a prep and drape. We can prep and drape both sides and then we can sit down and do the surgery that we wanna do, assuming we can get the, the reduction. Our landmarks, remember we stacked the upper sacral segment and we already planned this on the sagittals. We've adjusted like Dr. Creter has taught us to make sure we get down the midline and make sure we've got the C-arm rotated and the patient rotated right. And now we can sort of work on correcting the deformity and sometimes we can just add traction. And when we add traction, we can restore this arc and it may not be always exactly the way we want to, but we also have to realize the white stripe realize rec, uh, represents the intrusion of the articular area of the SI joint as well. And so that's a little bit of a false distractor for us. But this arc is improved as a result of just putting the patient in 10 pounds or 15 pounds of traction. And so you can see we've adjusted this. Uh, she's well enough for us to do something, but not much. And so we're going to assess 
our symmetry on the outlet, like Dr. Creter's already uh, taught us. The arc of congruity in the front is much better than what we had earlier, and we're gonna proceed with our iliosacral screw. We're gonna see those tunnel exit points and real, remember their shoots. We've planned out where it needs to go. We see the limits to where we are with this little spike of cast. We wanna be in front of that and above that S1 tunnel below L5. We've already gone below L5 because we're low and anterior. Again, caudal and anterior, this safe spot for putting the first guy in the elevator. You may say, well, I'd like to have an oblique screw first to do an improved reduction. If I do an oblique screw first, I might get a better reduction if I sort of start at posterior and go caudal to cranial and low to high, I could, I could do that. But I'm worried that it, I wanna get that transsacral fixation and maybe I'm gonna have a crash. I'd, I'd rather use a transsacral screw. And so you, you may wanna sort out your planning how you're gonna orient the screws and what your sequencing is gonna be. So if you wanna do an oblique screw first in order to help with the reduction, and this is gonna be its pathway, then you can add in the transsacral screw and see where those screws cross. And you can just mark it and you see it, the, the screws would cross on the inlet view. On the inlet view, the screws would have conflict right there on the right side of the mid, mid body. And then on the outlet view, you see they would have conflict out, out in the ailer area. So we know that the screws can be done in sequence and without interfering one another as long as we position them as we planned. We, we can't make a real precise plan and then go rogue in the operating room and, and not be precise because then we're gonna have trouble with our implants. So the plan has to be precise and then the execution of the plan has to be precise as well. So we, we opted to just do a transsacral screw as a result of the situation we were in. We do the inlet, we do the outlet. You can see in the lateral allows us to see we're not as anterior as we might've thought in the ellipsoid. And then we proceed with our inlet outlets to follow across and we go through this conduit of bone, just like we planned. That's the yellow dot that we planned preoperatively in the upper sacral segment, the caudal anterior area. And then we realize when we get to this point, we may be wandering a little bit anteriorly. And so we can recorrect with a guide pin, a bent guide pin, just like you do for a femur to help you recreate or redirect the drill where you'd like to go and then put the guide pin through. Now comes the time to put the guide pin in and we're going to put it through the pathway that we prepared, but we're not gonna go drilling through the lateral cortex until the guide pin gets right next to it. Then we're gonna use this oblique view that we planned on and we're gonna see and feel the guide pin hit it. And then we're gonna see and feel the guide pin exit it. And then we're gonna be able to have a real accurate depth assessment. And for this patient, we want a little bit of compression. So we have to do a little bit of fast math. So maybe it measures 170 or 130, 150, and we're gonna pull a centimeter and a half or two centimeters off so that when we put the lag screw in and use this oblique view to see exactly where the washer should land later before we start to tighten, we wanna make sure that we've got it to where the washer doesn't intrude. We like washers because they help us improve the, the, the force distribution. And then we wanna see if our math was right when we roll on the other side, we wanna make sure that we have the right length screw. In this situation, we do an initial lag screw that you can see here in the lower anterior quadrant of the upper sacral segment. We added in then a subsequent fully threaded screw in the more cranial posterior uh, area of S1 that was safe. And then we took the risk of the nine millimeter conduit and put in the seven millimeter screw again, anterior and within the safe area of the screw. And so we're left with a fairly symmetrical pelvis, not so good. We're uh, down the middle as far as the, the outlet goes. And you can see that if we rotate take the patient and get the greater static notches off, like you see the yellow arrow here, we can look down the barrel of our screws. That doesn't really mean much. It just means our screws are probably crooked. If we bring this greater static notches back into alignment, then our screws are a little bit crooked. So for some reason, people love taking pictures of their cannulated screws looking right down the hole in the screw. And I don't know why, especially when it's crooked like this, but uh, so be it. Anyway, when we finish, we want to make sure that we land the screws. We don't intrude the screws. Once the screws intrude, they lose their function. Sometimes, like you can see here, the second screw in the upper sacral segment was a little close to the first washer, so we didn't stack the washers or pancake the washers. We just used it without a washer, and we were careful in the landing it. We go to uh, figure out what to do in the front, and you can see the laparotomy is quite low, and then we stress the, the pelvis in the front and she has not much movement. We can convert, add a frame, uh, do ORF, whatever it is that you would choose to do. Well, you can see at the result, we've got a, a ring uh, reduction that looks like this. Uh, we've corrected her deformity on the outlet, and then if you look at her axials, you can see how on the left is her injury CT uh, at the S1 and uh, at the quadrilateral surface, 
and you can see the symmetry has been somewhat restored. And then the posterior ring is a mess as a result of a lot of things. She's not quite perfectly reduced. And of course, she's got the anterior sacral crush that you see. And then she lived happily ever after, except she's had uh, three separate follow-up uh, pelvic CT scans over the last seven years. This is a patient I did seven years ago. And she's had uh, three subsequent pelvic CTs for abdominal pain for pelvic inflammatory disease. So I've had the ability to follow her on uh, post-operative CT scans for a variety of other ailments that she has that are, are non-orthopedics. So I'm going to stop. Uh, and uh, I appreciate y'all's attention. And I appreciate y'all being a part of this. There's, there's just, um, again, today, we've given you the drip, the tip of the iceberg of knowledge regarding these implants and this technique. But hopefully you've got some idea of the indications and contraindications. I would think that you've noticed the pattern through all of the, the speakers of the osteology and the variety of the upper sacral segment, especially, and then how important the radiology is. Radiology is so important to pelvic uh, successful uh, diagnosis and uh, planning and surgery. And then not just the preoperative radiology, but the intraoperative uh, radiology as well, and how those axial and surface rendered and also the sagittal images help so much. And again, we talked about the precision is good uh, from the planning and it has to be executed as well. And then I, I, I like the post-op CT scan just because it allows me to do uh, a lot of post-op uh, post critique. And so with that, Steve, I'm going to stop and I appreciate uh, your attention. And, uh, thank you all for letting me be a part of your webinar.